Good morning, everyone. It's 930 here, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Erin Kopech, and I'm the Marketing Director for Extra Health. Thank you for joining us today for our Workplace Excellence webinar um, discussing everything work comp. Um, Chad Brandon will be our speaker today from the TEDRA group, and we will announce him momentarily. Um, just a little housekeeping things before we get started. The call will last about one hour. Um, you are set up in listen-only mode, but you can relay questions in the question box function at the bottom of your screen, and we will kind of answer those as we go. All right, thank you for joining us, and Chad, I turn it over to you. Okay, um, Aaron, thank you, and thanks to Extra Help for allowing myself and the Tedrick Group to be a part of your Workplace Excellence uh, webinar series. Looks like I'm having trouble controlling the presentation, Aaron. There you go. Oh, there we go. Got it. Okay. All right. We are all set. <clears throat> we may come in under an hour, uh, depending on the amount of questions that are asked. So please, as we uh, as we move along, if anyone has any questions at all, type them in the chat feature, and that'll make it more um, uh, more interactive, for as interactive as a webinar can be. I am a certified risk architect with the Tedrick Group. Tedrick Group is a commercial insurance and risk management firm. We've been in business for a little over uh, 31 years. And just so there's no confusion as we get farther along in the process or in the presentation, we are compensated or, or paid as an insurance agency, so handling insurance policies for our clients. However, our business model the past oh, six or seven years has changed, uh, changed quite a bit. We spend the majority of our time as risk management partners with our clients. So we get in, uh, heavily involved with, uh, with safety, implementing safety programs, human resources, compliance, et cetera. So, so a lot is outside the boundaries of insurance. So the topic today, work comp. What is it and how do I lower my costs? This uh, first, the first part about what is it, um, be a few slides, and that's going to be the not so exciting part of this presentation, but then I hope as we get into, um, into how to lower your costs that that will uh, draw some more interest and um, hopefully raise a few questions. So what is work comp? <clears throat> there are two parts, part A and part B. Part A is what we are all familiar with. It's insurance that provides cash benefits and or medical care for workers who are injured or become ill as a direct result of their job. And then uh, work comp, as many of you probably know, there it does uh, vary state to state. And then some states are uh, monopolistic where employers must obtain work comp from a compulsory state fund. And those states are North Dakota, Ohio, Washington, Wyoming, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. So part B, the um, uh, not so familiar part, is employers' liability coverage. This is what protects the employer in the event the employee feels the employer was negligent, and that's why they were hurt. So we, we don't see very many claims at all under employer's liability coverage, but this would be something like uh, uh, there's an unsafe work environment, and maybe it's been brought up several times, and it's never been, been uh, corrected. But again, and then the employee sues the employer as a result of that. But again, we, don't, we have seen claims with employer's liability coverage, but we do not see very many. And my, uh, I meant to say at the beginning, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. So if a question is not asked during the webinar that um, you want to talk offline, my, I'll have my email address, uh, work line, cell phone, so be contacted uh, anytime. Okay, as far as limits, there are no limits under Part A. That's, that is set by uh, Workers' Compensation Board in each state. 
the amount that would be paid to the injured employee. Employer's liability, however, does have set limits. The uh, basic statutory limits are 100,000 per occurrence for bodily injury, 100,000 per employee for bodily injury by disease, and a $500,000 policy limit for bodily injury by disease. And we don't, we actually, all of our clients buy, buy higher limits than these basic statutory limits. Um, I mean, it's fairly inexpensive and makes it an easy decision to do because in the unlikely event you do have an employer's liability claim, these limits can be um, uh, eaten up fairly quickly. Okay, now, and, and to get into the costs piece, before we can talk about how to lower your cost, we need to identify what your costs are for workers' compensation. So the, the most obvious are your premiums, but, but there are other costs associated. So for example, any retained losses. Now, uh, I'm going to assume most everyone on the line uh, is not on a deductible program, so in other words, it's a, a first dollar guaranteed cost, uh, but if you were on a deductible, say a $100,000 deductible, then you would be responsible for the first $100,000 of each work comp claim, and that would be an example of a retained loss. Um, any fees that are associated with your work comp program that are outside of your premiums, there could be a, uh, a broker fee or depending on your insurance program, there could be a fee to a third party administrator to adjudicate claims. So you want to you want to make sure that's factored in along with your, your premiums. And then the most common that's that's not thought of, but everyone has, are indirect costs. And we're gonna uh, dig a little deeper into what these are. So any any claim you have the direct cost of that claim, you know. Um, that's your medical that's paid out, um, any indemnity. But then the indirect cost, for example, cost to train and compensate a replacement worker, investigate the accident, implement corrective action, manage the claim, et cetera. And there are more I could list, but these, these I think are the most easy to understand because you have somebody that can't do the job that they were doing because they have, they got hurt. Somebody is filling in, or you've had to maybe even recruit and hire someone else. But this can go, uh, I mean, as far deep as even um, affecting employee morale. And it's essentially um, the more claims you have, the more inefficiencies that are created. And I, I thought I'd show you a graph. Um, this is from OSHA, and uh, the next slide I'll show you the, the link where I, I got this from, but a uh, study that OSHA has conducted where they have come up with a um, factors for what those indirect costs are. So on the, the bottom, the, uh, the horizontal axis, that's the direct cost of the claim, so how much the claim actually, what was paid out, so you can see at the, at the far left, excuse me, zero to $2,999 and then $3,000 to $499. The lower the claim, the higher the multiple for what the indirect costs are. So slide over to the far right where any, any claim that's $10,000 or more, dollars, the multiple is 1.1. So that's direct cost plus indirect cost would equal your total cost of your claim. I'll show you an example here. There's the link where you can uh, pull this chart up and learn about OSHA's study and how they came up with this. All right, so direct cost plus indirect cost equal your total cost for claims. So let's just assume there was one claim that was $50,000. That multiple for a claim 10,000 above was 1.1. So the indirect cost is 55,000. So really, that's costing your organization $105,000. And I've, I, I bring this up because oftentimes we're, we're, we're not thinking of what indirect costs are. 
And this is where you can see that your company can really be bogged down by the amount of frequency if you have high frequency of claims. And then this is a very simple statement, but it makes a lot of sense after seeing what the um, what the definition of indirect costs are and, and, and what those factors are based on the amount of claims, the, the dollar amount. But the more accidents that occur in the workplace, the higher the cost. So, you know, of course that makes sense, but the higher the cost of what? So both in your premiums are going to go up, your premiums for workers' compensation, but then your indirect costs are going to be greater as well. Okay, now we can get into the lowering cost part, which I'm sure this is what, uh, if I were you, this is what I'd be interested in. I'm sure all you guys are interested in. Second here, it's not pulling up. There we go. Okay, uh, first and foremost, um, in my opinion, to lower your insurance cost, you have to create a culture of safety within your organization and uh, management has to be committed to this as well or it doesn't work and this is not something that that happens overnight um, it it takes work we see all different scenarios with our clients and with prospective clients that we're speaking with some that um, have no safety programs some that are, are best of the best and are always looking for ways to get better and others that if you just asked if they have a safety committee the answer would be yes and if you leave it at that it sounds great and you say well when's the last time you met you say a year and a half ago that's an, obviously that needs to be revitalized so some of the some of the basic things to do to start creating that culture of safety or revitalize what you have, uh, freshen things up, regular safety training and communication with your employees. So the, the regular safety training piece, I believe there should be some in-person or stand-up training that you always have. And then you want to document that with sign-in sheets. But then you can also, from a just a, a constant communication standpoint, you can do uh, toolbox talks, safety talks, people call them lots of tailgate talks. There's lots of different names for them now. It can be on a, on a, a daily or weekly basis depending on um, the how hazardous your business environment is. But, but I think of this as just, uh, just it, you, have to, you have to keep safety in front of your employees all the time to keep it fresh, just like, like advertising a product to your clients or, or your, your own brand recognition for your companies. You have to keep it in front of people all the time. And this, um, and, and also I, I would recommend, depending on your workforce and their availability to computers, having some type of online training as well where, where you're tracking that. And that can be your, uh, you know, your bloodborne pathogens, refresher, um, even things like sexual harassment. And then, you're documenting this for uh, a few different reasons. Um, one, if if OSHA comes in and you do need to show OSHA what you've done from a um, uh, safety training and education standpoint for your employees, and and OSHA, by the way, they've they've been um, saying for probably the past six months or so that they're if they come into your place of business, they don't want to just talk to the person that's in charge of safety, but they want to walk through and maybe grab an employee off the floor and say, "Tell me about your tell me about your bloodborne pathogens program." So keep that in mind too that it's um, uh, the, your your employees. It's not just enough to sit in a room now, but they they really have to understand uh, what the topic is that you're going over. So uh, back to the documentation, um, another great reason. Well, you need to track internally anyway, so you can see what you've uh, what you've done for the you know past 12 months, what you've trained your employees on. But also from an insurance perspective, if you have a loss control meeting, and so the insurance company is bringing in their loss control representative to uh, look at your company and see how good or bad of a risk you are, 
it would be great to have something like this already printed out. Like, hey, here's what we've done for the past the past year, two years, whatever you want to show them from a, a training and education standpoint. And they're going to think, man, these guys, uh, they know what they're doing. But then also, if you ever were to have to prove in a court, too, that you're trying to make your workplace as safe as possible and educate your employees about safety as, uh, as much as you can. All right, Chad, there, there is a couple questions, if you want me to interrupt. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. There was one, do you help your clients implement safety processes and programs? Yes, the easy answer is um, yes, we do. Uh, there is no, there's no kind of boilerplate fix because uh, each of our customers are at, have different exposures or they're at different stages uh, from a from a safety perspective. Um, everybody's unique, I guess, would be the um, the thing to say there. So we really will go in and uh, lots of times conduct our own risk management assessments and uh, and from there pinpoint the key areas. And there might be. 10 things they come away with, but there are two that are very important. So the first year we just, we focus on those two, but the answer, um, answer is yes. All right. And also one of the attendees, they're asking if you can provide the link again, the, oh, web, sure. the web address um, to get the direct and indirect calls for work comp. Yes. Give me just a second here. There we go. Just wait a few minutes and then um, we'll continue back on. So back to that first question, um, we do that for a variety of reasons. You know, the, the insurance industry has, uh, has historically just handled the placing the insurance and then that's it. You know, you don't do anything else unless there's a claim or somebody needs a certificate of insurance. Our business models changed quite a bit because, well, you know, you know the whole environment's changed, and a lot, a lot of folks on the phone. You you need to address safety, but you may not have the resources to do that. You don't have a full-time safety person that that you can hire, unlike a big Fortune 500 company or Fortune 100 company, where they might have a team of risk managers where that's all they do all day long, identify, prioritize, and mitigate risk. So we we partner with what we call middle market companies to become that outsourced risk manager and, and we're doing it just for the cost of insurance. So what we're our commission that's built in the insurance, we, we feel like that's how we build long term partnerships with our clients and and it's it's the right thing to do. Not to just wait for a claim to happen, but let's try to prevent as much as possible. And then by doing that, we're, we, you can take it a step farther. We're actually helping our clients improve their profit margins. When you look at how much claims cost and how indirect costs, what, what those costs are and how, it, the, how much inefficiency that creates. But I'm glad there are questions, so please, if, uh, if those questions or my comments spark any others, don't hesitate to uh, type them in. And if I didn't answer anyone's question correctly, then uh, please let me know what else you'd like. Uh, the third bullet point here, uh, safety committee. I believe that um, it's, it's very important to have a, a safety committee and should be populated with not just management folks, but um, but labor as well. And, and you don't have to meet every week or maybe every even month. It just it can, it, yeah, everyone's unique and it depends on, on your business environment, your exposures and where your safety culture is. But this is a great way to again, just create, you're, you're in everyone's, you're in everyone's face about safety and you're, you're, you're getting ownership from the people on the, on the safety committee and that's why you want some of the, the, the labor or frontline folks as well. Um, next, safety takes constant attention, but uh, we we truly believe that uh, that safety pays, and um, 
not just in the obvious of preventing claims and reducing premiums, but going back to the indirect cost and, uh, and improving employee morale. And then just in, in staying with the um, creating a culture of safety, uh, I believe you should do accident investigation. So if you have a claim, don't just fill out the form and send it in to your insurance carrier or insurance agency and then nothing happens since then. I mean, you should have the, uh, you should have your employer, your employee, I apologize, your employee that had the incident writing down, it's kind of the, the uh, what, when, where, how, why, uh, describing what happened. And then you can have things like, uh, were they wearing the, uh, the appropriate um, uh, personal protective equipment? Uh, what could have been done to uh, prevent this from happening? And then their supervisor should sign off on that as well. And then ultimately, somebody should be in charge of reviewing these accident investigation forms and then make appropriate changes and corrections. Don't just let the don't just let the, the carrier handle handle the claim and assume everything is going to be well and, and any issues you have are going to correct themselves because it may very well there's something that you can change that will prevent someone else from being hurt. So really you, you have the you're just trying to keep your employees safe. But this also may help you identify somebody that maybe there's no uh, there's no fraudulent issues with the claim, but but they're they have uh, been a repeater of a certain type of incident, and, and maybe it's just uh, uh, maybe they're moving too fast. But it's having that conversation with them, and everyone knows that you're paying attention then too. I hear, yeah, I think I said this already, but the goal here to keep your employees safe and prevent future like injuries from happening. And, and I, you know, we, we see this work too, so it's not just, uh, not just me kind of preaching this, but we, our clients that are bought in to creating a good safety culture that we partner with, there's no doubt their claim frequency, severity goes down and their premiums go down. Uh, next, in, in when, when a claim does happen, uh, manage the claim and, and um, get, get the employee back to work. If it's a legitimate claim, there's nothing fraudulent about it, <clears throat> it's a good employee, people feel more productive if they're at work. So even if they cannot do the job that they were doing, get them back doing something else so they're not, they're not sitting at home, let them heal at work. Um, We've been calling these programs uh, recovery at, at work programs, and you know, often, often they're called uh, light duty or return to work. <clears throat> and manage your experience modification factor. So there could probably be a whole webinar on just what is your experience mod, but unless you're self-insured, this this comes into play. This impacts your your premiums. And we'll I have an example on the on the next slide. But but before we get into that, um, at the safety committee level, I think transparency is a great thing. And share your experience mod with the safety committee members. And if you've got you know show your historical mod. So if you have five years, to trend it and. Um, um, show where you're going, and this uh, next slide will talk about uh, your minimum experience mod. We can tell you what your, how low you can go, so then that can be a goal of, um, for your safety committee or all of your employees, and depending on how transparent, how much information that you, that you want to share, so you can start to monetize safety and risk management. And on uh, uh, experience mod too, and, and getting employees back to work, for um, uh, most states, there's a pretty heavy discount if the claim is not a lost time claim. So if it's medical only, it's usually up to 70% uh, 
discount if you're in if you're in NCCI state. So I mean that's a uh, that's a pretty big discount and incentive to get employees back to work before it's a lost time accident. Okay, here are a bunch of numbers. Um, so the title here, how much money are you giving up? And it, and it has to do with your experience mod. And I'll walk everyone through this. So at the top, the example is, is, is $100,000 in workers' compensation premium for a, just a made-up company. And this $100,000 would be uh, what we call uh, manual rates. So it's just based on the work comp class codes that are assigned to your company and the payroll for each code and the rate that that particular carrier charges, and let's just say that comes out to be $100,000. Now, below the line, so after that $100,000, one of the things that, a big big part that impacts your premium is your experience modification factor. So over on the far left, it says 2014 NCCI experience modification, 2.15. So this is just, this is made up, and we're saying this company in 2014, their mod was 2.15, which is which is really high, by the way. So that means more than likely that's an unsafe work environment, and they're having lots of claims, probably high frequency and severity. So the average or the normal mod is one. So that's like getting a getting a C, but but then you know you're just your average one. So this one is 115 basis points over one, or 115 percent. So the additional premium that they would pay is 115,000, so 100 plus 115, 215,000. And then we'll go over to the right, in 2015 it comes down to 1.39, so that's 39% above one, and we're assuming that premium is still 100,000, so they pay an extra 39,000, so their premium is 139,000. Go to the right again, if it were one, which is normal, then the mod does not affect their manual premium, so it stays at 100,000. And then what we show our clients, and I, I, I think it's very important for you all to know this, what's my minimum mod, how low can I go, and in this case, for this company, it's 0.88, and I've seen some much lower than this, but uh, 0.88, so if they were at 0.88, then their premium would go down from 100,000 to 88,000, so they would be getting a discount of uh, $12,000. So then you can look at, okay, well, how much have I been giving up because I'm not at my minimum mod? So in 2014, they paid an extra $127,000. That's uh, 115000 plus then the, the 12000 from going to uh, 1 to 0.88. 2015, they paid, paid an extra 51,000, and then um, from the normal of one, there's $12,000 lower to get to 88,000. So again, this is just a way to, 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 to monetize what some people have a hard time talking about safety and risk management, and, and uh, it, it costs too much money. And, and you know, I would just dis I would absolutely disagree and say that safety pays, and you just have to be able to position it in the right manner to show the money that you can save by creating a good safety culture. Uh, next, <clears throat> kind of outside the safety realm here, but 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 very important. When you finish your your 12-month policy, and then you get contacted two or three months later by an auditor to come in, and uh, the insurance carrier wants to see what your actual payrolls were for this period. And we try to educate our clients to make this as painless as possible and, and basically have a packet ready for the auditor when he or she would, uh, would come in. So have, your, have, it, have this prepared. Have your payroll broken out per class code. And if, if anyone has questions about what's included or not included in payroll, you can uh, shoot me an email afterwards and I can, I can send you a few, uh, a few tips. Uh, certificates of insurance. Don't make the auditor ask for these. Have these ready so that the, the people that are coming onto your property and doing work for you 
throughout that, that did work for you throughout that policy year. That's one of the things the auditor wants to know, and they want to know that you got a certificate of insurance from those vendors or subcontractors to prove that they have insurance. And if you didn't do that, the worst case scenario, you will have to pay whatever revenue you paid them, that's going to go, that's going to be added to your payroll and you're going to pay workers' compensation premium for them because if they were hurt at your site, then your work comp could pick it up if that vendor does not have work comp coverage. And if anybody wants, if, if you need a sample certificate of what that should look like from your vendor, email me and I can, uh, I'll shoot one over to you. And ask the auditor to send a list of what she or he will be looking for. So again, you, you have as much ready as, as you can. Um, just again, make it as painless as possible. And we're all busy, but this is important. You don't want to get hit with additional or unnecessary premium. So just the more prepared you are, the better. It's kind of like that loss control meeting, what you can have that prepared in terms of what you already do with safety and safety training, then they're going to think, man, these, these guys are good. They, they, know what's, uh, they know what's going on. Um, next, kind of going back to the uh, topic of, of uh, safety a little bit, just something that we do for, uh, for our clients. This is a proprietary tool uh, designed specifically for workers' compensation and it's, it's best practices for your workers' compensation program. It's about 20 questions or so, and it allows us to, g to give you a score. So it's, it comes almost back to that monetizing piece. But So this is a, a, a quantifiable tool, again, in that mysterious um, risk management world. The questions have to be answered on a scale of 1 to 5, so there is no yes, no. It's uh, based on level of effectiveness. And uh, industry expert prepared this, the um, uh, Institute of Work Comp, and then we get this from a bigger, uh, a bigger network with protected territories that we're we're a part of. But anyway, I'd be again offline. I can uh, be happy to share this with any of you too. But this is it's just something to to uh, to help you get better. There we go. All right, next, uh, and the tool we just looked at can be a part of this slide. <coughs> but, <coughs> pardon me. Get the very best information to your underwriter at the insurance carrier. So what do I mean by that? If you just, um, if all the insurance carrier gets from your organization are the insurance applications, the accord forms that the agency is filling out, then in my opinion, it's, it's not good enough. The carrier doesn't know you by, from those forms. You're not putting your best foot forward and giving that underwriter a reason to give you their best price and best coverages. And that, that's why, you know, if there's a big, uh, if, if you bid your insurance out and you're, you're having you know, 10 agencies come in, I think it actually hurts you more, more than, it, than it helps you. So you want to be able to <clears throat> tell your story to the underwriter, your uh, uh, history of business, why, why you're successful, why you've been in business as long as you have. Talk about what you've done from a uh, safety perspective. Uh, if, if you have returned to work, if you have a return to work program, talk about that, any successes that you've had. We like to get in, uh, uh, go in pretty good detail for any large claims. And in, in this slide, we're saying uh, 50,000 and above, uh, especially if it's a case where um, it, it never should have happened. And you know, so, so what have we learned from that? How have we gotten better? Uh, number one, date reported versus date of injury. If the, if, if the date reported on your loss runs is always late, then that sends up a red flag, kind of says that the underwriter is going to think that company and management, that they, that they don't care, all these employees report late, maybe they're scared to report a claim, lots of different things can go into it. So we, we, try, to, we try to have a, a, a pretty in-depth discussion 
with between the underwriters and any of our clients because th this is how, again, in lowering your cost, you're going to get the best uh, best pricing and best coverage that you can get. This illustration, uh, go to the far right where it says renewal date and then uh, uh, three months before that would be month nine. That, this is where we find that uh, most companies start working on insurance and safety uh, because all of a sudden now it's important because our, our renewal is coming up in three months. So now let's start doing stuff and, uh, and, and then maybe even try and implement a safety program and then get bids. And, and we just, um, our philosophy is totally against this. So we'll, we, we believe this should be a process ongoing throughout the year. And with uh, prospective clients, we'll actually come in three months after. We'll let the renewal date pass, come in three months after, go through our own risk management assessment. And it's all geared towards risk profile improvement and use that information to reduce your insurance cost, to drive them down. So by improving your risk profile, kind of like a credit score. So every individual has a credit score. But when an underwriter looks at you, there's a, a, a risk profile that they are developing on you. So we want to make your risk profile as good as possible so you get the best price that you can. Some of the uh, partners we use for the tools that we have, um, Beyond Insurance Global Network, uh, there's about 35 agencies that we partner with across the country and come together and share best practices and resources. And it's a lot of it is geared towards Everything I'm talking about today, it's it's a risk man it's taking a risk management approach to insurance, as opposed to just uh, uh, get a quote and a price and then do nothing else. Succeed Management Solutions. It's an online risk man risk management center that we use. Which uh, a couple slides I'll show you more on that, but but that's where you can deliver online. Uh, online safety training, uh, incident tracking, OSHA tracking. There's lots of uh, pretty sophisticated. Uh, next, just a, just a funny picture, and I've used this in another presentation, so hopefully you guys haven't seen it before, but this is a partner agency of ours in Alabama. Uh, they're driving down the road, and you know, you be the risk manager. What's wrong with this picture? Uh, and, and in you being the risk manager, it, by creating a, taking the time and the effort to create a good safety culture, you don't want just one risk manager. You want all of your employees to be risk managers. So they're, they're all able to identify an unsafe work environment or identify a hazard, and they know the proper channels to go through to get it corrected, almost like a, a community watch. They're looking out for their fellow employee. We all came to work safe. We want to leave work safe. So in this picture, there's actually a guy sitting on this mower that's on the trailer. So I, what in the world are they thinking? But driving down the road, sitting on the mower on the back of the trailer, you, you never know what you're going to see. Go back to this for a second. I started to uh, put a picture, one that I've taken, uh, but I, I didn't want to offend anyone on the line if it were if it were their business, but it was a guy on an extremely, extremely steep roof. We were actually doing a loss control walkthrough. It was not for the carrier. It was part of our risk management audit. And we uh, we hired an independent risk management firm to come in. And while we're doing the walkthrough, there's a guy on this steep roof. There were about 20 mile, 20 mile an hour winds that day. And he was, uh, he worked in their maintenance department. He was repairing uh, patches on the roof. And he was not tied off at all, and his ladder wasn't uh, secured, and so it's a, at best several OSHA fines, but at worst, I mean, he falls off, and again, it's a pretty high roof, pretty steep. He falls off, and he's disabled for life, or maybe even dies, and, but that goes back to safety culture. He thought it was okay to get up there, which means his manager probably thinks it's okay, probably thought it was okay for him to get up there, so there's a cultural problem that needs to be corrected. Okay, so we're, we're just about done here, so we'll end up 
uh, finishing a little early, but okay, so what do I do from here? You stick your head in the ground and uh, do nothing because how do I, how do, I do all this? Uh, my recommendation, uh, it takes a village. You, know, you, you are all busy. You're not wearing just one hat. You're wearing many, many hats. So utilize the resources that you have access to for free to help manage your risk. And if you want to talk to me more about that, again, my contact information will be up in a minute, so please feel free to call me anytime, email me anytime. <clears throat> but you can get some of these services from your insurance company, insurance broker. You might be able to get um, something from your attorney, uh, another consultant or associations. Uh, and one of my clients, uh, we had a law firm come in. Because we start talking about risk management, then it's not just safety. It's, it's what, what risks hurt the organization. They felt their supervisors needed to be needed more training on how to uh, properly discipline employees and follow their progressive dis disciplinary procedure. So we got a law firm to come in and uh, spend about three hours with their top, all of their managers going over that information, which I thought was extremely beneficial. Then we actually relayed all that information to the underwriter for their employment, employment practices liability insurance to um, get a good renewal for them there. But more importantly, it's better for their, it's a good thing for their organization. Don't try to read everything on this slide, but this is um, the online risk management center that I mentioned. This is a company called Succeed, and we buy this, we'll provide it to our clients, but this is where um, online training is the most easy to use. You dump all your employees into the system, separate them by location if you have multiple locations, push training out to them, track them as they've gone through it and completed it, and then it's you, it's all saved in the cloud. And your in-person trainings you can put on there too. But, and there's a lot of uh, you know, safety data sheet management, um, HR side, a lot of capabilities. Again, my name is Chad Brandon. I work with the Tedrick Group. I'm a uh, shareholder and um, certified risk architect here. That's my email address, chadb at chadrickgroup.com. If you call the office line, uh, somebody will pick up and they can always find me, but feel free to call my cell. If you have any questions, shoot me a text. It's been my pleasure to go through this with you guys. And Aaron, I'm finished. I don't know if any other questions have popped up or not. Um, there was one, but if anyone else has any questions they would like to submit, um, please take the next couple of minutes to go ahead and type in your questions and we will get those answered. Um, they, someone was wanting to know if you're going to make your presentation available to those attend, who attended. Uh, yeah, I think that would be just fine. Do you think that's okay, Erin? Yes. I mean, I think um, we are recording this presentation, so it will be live on our website um, sometime by the end of the day today. Um, but, Chad, I don't know if you want to send out um, your PowerPoint. That's completely up to you. Okay. That should be fine. I don't see any reason why we can't do that. You'll, you'll have a list of... Uh, all the email addresses that have logged on? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Let's see if we have any other questions here. There is a couple more questions. Let me expand them and I'll read those off to you. Okay. All right. How do we know our business needs a risk management consultation? answer to that. Um, the most simple would be if, if you're having work comp problems, you're, you're having claims, and they need to be, uh, need to get them under control, but then, you know, you, you've waited till the last minute. Um, I mean, every business has a risk that they face. Some is more severe than others. Um, you know, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk with that person offline about 
uh, the makeup of their organization, and um, I could give them my idea if they need it or not. If there are five employees, then probably not necessary because the owner is there every day with those five employees. They know everything that's going on. They're a close-knit group. Uh, but as your organization grows, and you know we've got clients with as uh, many as uh, a thousand employees, and, and then obviously it gets harder and harder to manage your risk, and you have to get more sophisticated. Uh, we're working with a company right now. Uh, we're actually going to uh, put them into a different kind of program. It's a, a member-owned group captive, and it's where they just to really make it simple. If you have a good safety culture and you can control your claims in this program, you get money back. So instead of the carrier keeping the money, you get it you get it returned to you. But we did a risk control assessment with them, and and it came out that um, they were they they had kind of taken their uh, eye off the ball a little bit. There were guys driving on their forklifts without without seat belts on, for example, just 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 silly stuff that they needed to get. They weren't documenting training as well as they used to. So they needed to get a refresher, and that's what came to light. And they're uh, they're working on that right now. I hope that's I hope that answers the question. Someone also asked, "How about the audit to do list?" I'm not sure if this was, was a specific piece of your presentation, but I just now saw this. Um, that was not in there. I assume that's when we go through a risk management audit. The things that the things we do during that process. I assume that's what they mean, and I, I'm not willing to just send that out. I would, but but I've talked to anybody about it, and um, and then we can figure out maybe after that if it makes sense to share that. And we change it too. Um, again, there's no just boilerplate. I mean, there are some standard things that we always want to look at, but but it's based on your needs. Um, one of the things we look at again, it's not just work comp driven. So we'll get into human resources, and we have an HR consultant that we use, and that that's a hot topic for a lot of companies right now. So that might be their biggest concern. Others, it's um, it's safety training. So we'll we'll hit on certain areas in our audit depending on from kind of an initial uh, uh, discovery meeting what their concerns are. All right. It looks like there's no more questions coming in. So. I believe that wraps it up. Thank you everyone for attending today. Um, like I said, everyone that attended will be getting a copy of the presentation so you can um, look back over it, print it out. Um, we also will have the webinar on our website, extrahealthinc.com. Um, it will be on there um, sometime later this afternoon if you can also um, get that link and view it at a later date as well. Thank you, Chad, and everyone have a really good day. Thank you. Thanks, Erin. Thank you. Thanks, everyone that tuned in.